And Port Authority Police has the unwarranted distinction of being the only police department in the United States to have lost 37 police officers in the line of duty. The most police officers ever killed in a single day in the line of duty. Uh, 37 men and women died that day. And to honor them, uh, their uniform, usually have the patch on one side and the American flag. You have to wear the, our code uniform, our uniforms, you have to wear the American flag. So they decided to remove the one American flag, incorporate it into the two towers with 37 into the other patch, and that's now worn on the uniform to honor them. Uh, but all total, Port Authority that day lost 75 employees. 75 of our brothers and sisters perished that day. And the other 38 were civilians. They could have been plumbers, electricians, uh, or most of the higher ranking of the Port Authority, because every morning they would go to the windows of the world and have breakfast with the superintendent, with the police chief, with the executive director, and there they would coordinate and plan the day's events. And they were always up there early, 7, 7.30, and they were caught above the floors and they were all killed. Our chairman of the board, our executive director, deputy director, police chief, superintendent, they were all above the floors, trying to do their best, but they all perished when the building came down. Now, the, the, the interesting part is that most of those, or all these, most of these people worked at ground level or below ground. That's what our offices were for the average worker, not the executive directors on their plush 12-foot high ceilings upstairs on the, on the building. But these people were able to get out. So they were able to get out and leave. However, they chose to stay behind because they figured, hey, we have access to all the rooms. We have all the keys. We have all the cards. We know the lay of the land. We know the lay of the building. These firemen, these rescuers are coming here. They don't know their way around the building. So we can help them facilitate and move people faster. So they chose to go back in, not realizing that that was the last choice they ever made. When the buildings came down, 37 paid the ultimate price because they felt that they wanted to help others instead of themselves. Instead of running, as it is their job to do, they weren't required to stay. They didn't take an oath of obligation to stay behind, but they chose to stay behind because they wanted to help. And that's the spirit that I'm talking about. However, that number doesn't comprise this number. 343 New York City firefighters died in a single day. Uh, the most anywhere around the world is significantly far more than anybody else. Uh, and if you look at their history from around the 1850s and now, they've lost close, a little over seven, 750 members in their force. They lost half that amount one day, almost, which is amazing. And it took them 100, over 150 years to lose that kind of amount. That they almost lost it all in one single day. Now, many houses uh, also suffered. Now, usually when a, a, a crew comes in, uh, in those days they had chalkboards and they would put the names of those men working starting with the officer, the battalion chief, whoever they were, and the names would be on there, and then until the end of their tour, their names would get erased, and the new fresh names would come in. Well, every time a unit goes out, when they return, the officer on duty must call command and say, uh, Engine 10, all present accounted for, back in house. Now they know everybody came back. Well, on many instances at that time in New York City, command did not get that phone call from many houses because those men and women went out, and many of them did not come back. So their names are still written on most of these firehouses. Their names are still on the chalk pole. Their lockers are still locked and left as they were that day in honor of the memory, and they will never be erased. Now, what they tried to do was, uh, they decided that in front of Engine 10 and Ladder 10, which is right across the street from the Royal Trade Center, it's called 10 House, uh, they decided that they were gonna build a 50 foot long, six foot high bronze monolith depicting the entire 9-11 scene. And on the bottom are all the names of all the firefighters who perished on that day with their rank and insignia as well. And this is right out in the open of the street. It's not part of a museum or anything. Now, the, the one part we don't talk about is the children. Now, no children perished at either of the three sites, but these were the ones that were flying on airplanes. Oh. And all, the, all these children did perish. And it's amazing you hear the stories as I travel. Uh, I did this, I, I've done this many times, but not recently, I was in Georgia on the July 11th, and I'm telling the story, and the senior warden jumps up and he goes, you see those two young daughters, girls in the bottom left hand? I was at their parents' wedding, and I was at some christening or whatever that they had. He goes, so I know those two children myself. Mm -hmm. And you realize, that when you hear these stories of people, uh, that it did touch a lot of people, and it did touch the international community, because 27 nations had citizens here working at the World Trade Center who perished. So it just wasn't uh, uh, a United States attack. And as our brother, Right Worshipful Gene said, uh, the senior warden of his lodge was also killed. And I'm currently working with the Masonic Service Association to try to figure out how many Masons perished uh, during that day, including those that have perished afterwards from breathing and ingesting that air. 
Uh, we have about half a dozen. It doesn't seem to be too many, but we're working with jurisdictions to get that information to us. Now, remember before I told you that the Port Authority saved a lot of steel? Uh, they created the World Trade Center steel program. And I'm sure it might be pieces of steel here in Oregon or throughout the country. There are memorial parks and museums or libraries and city halls or firehouses that have a piece of steel. And the Port Authority said as long as you use it for nonprofit and don't make money off it and make it a memorial, we're willing to give you any piece you want. And it could be as small as that, as that projector or a 50-ton piece. If you're willing to come get it, we'll give it to you. And when they closed up in January of 2018, they had given away over 1,700 pieces to many places and museums, even around the world, including the USS New York, which was commissioned shortly after the attacks as a new naval warship. The front bow of this ship is made with seven and a half tons of short steel melted from the World Trade Center site. So wherever this ship goes, ensuring our freedoms and liberties around the world, it does so in memory with that World Trade Center steel in it. Uh, the largest base in Afghanistan also has a piece of steel that was donated uh, by the Port Authority. Uh, there are all the flags of all the allied nations that are participating in the fight against war on terror. And in the center is a piece of steel because effectively that's why we're there. We started because of 9-11. This is the newest memorial. If you, get, if you haven't been there before, this is brand new. It just opened up in August. And this is the Glade Memorial, and it honors all those who have died after the attacks because of ingesting or breathing the air of the chemicals at ground zero. Uh, over 1,700 people have perished because of this disease. Uh, and it is estimated that eventually this disease will kill more people than the terrorists did on that day. So every day we're still living, reliving that 9-11 because we sometimes come to roll call or we come to the job and we see the face of, a, of one of our co-workers had retired or forced medically retired and now he perished. And that's another funeral we have to attend and it's 18 years later. Now, some of the beauties that came out was like this incident here. Uh, Gander, Nova, Newfoundland. Uh, it's one of the farthest northern points of entry into North America. And it was a military base back then, so it had large airfields because the bombers used to leave there to go across to fight the war in, uh, in Europe, World War II. And when they grounded all air traffic, this little city grew by 65%. 6,600 people landed all of a sudden. They're a little community. And they had no resources, they didn't have enough hotels. So this community opened up their homes and made sure that every person, flight crew, passengers, was well received and was given a warm bed and food and clothing and a shower. And they were there for days until they were able to regain their fight and leave again. And it was so encouraging to see the goodness of humanity that every year they returned for a reunion. They've, many friendships have lasted all these years. And a new Broadway musical has been written, and it's traveling the country now. It's in, it's in New York City. Come from a way, and it tells the story of the beautiful uh, events that transpired shortly after the 9-11 attacks, which most people don't hear, don't even realize. A lot of people don't even know what this musical is about. But Come from a Way just won the best musical this past year. Uh, it is a great musical, and it tells a story of how humanity put aside the differences and accepted and opened their arms. And that's the beauty of it.